What I'm going to give to you today is a, a, a triptych. I'm going to start with some nonfiction, um, then go into fiction, and then close out with a, uh, with a few poems. And I'm very much a uh, you know, pen and paper, face in the book type of person. Uh, but, you know, we've all been living in these strange green lit rectangles, kind of Hollywood squares revisited. Um, and I wanted to take the opportunity to um, do something different and a bit more feral. Uh, any of my students in the, in the workshop know that I, I use that word a lot about the, the feral nature of writing and the imagination. Uh, and so I'm going to pay heed to that with this work here. So um, thanks for being here. Thanks for your time and patience. I hope you have something refreshing with you. Um, and with no further ado, away we go. So welcome to the Purple and Gold Sessions, which is basically a deep dive into some of the work that I've been doing um, while I'm here with you all at, um, at Williams. Looking back on baseball's silent season. Uh, this was published in the October 28th, 2020 issue of the New York Times Magazine. I'm just gonna read excerpts of it from the beginning and from the end. I take out the middle, which um, concerns itself with um, social justice protests uh, and the uh, you know, issues that besieged us, elevated us, horrified us, mystified us, uh, and enlightened us over the summer of 2020. I've taken that part. Um, I've taken that part out. I think I, I address it a bit in the work after that. So I'll just read um, these fragments, and from here on, I guess we're um, we're on our way. Looking back on baseball silent season, two words have been on my mind constantly these recent months, and they are room tone. Room tone is the sound a space makes when there is no other sound but the sound of the space itself. The subtle sounds in a high ceilinged room with brick walls and wide windows are different from those of a small room with wood paneled walls and narrow windows or those of the upper deck of a completely empty stadium or those of the lower deck of a completely empty stadium. Every space has a tone, every space speaks. Capturing room tone is essential for film and television production. After a scene of dialogue, someone on set asks for silence so that the room tone can be recorded. This sound becomes the baseline atmosphere of the scene and is mixed into it in order to create a sonic commonality, a unified field. When room tone is lost, things seem less real. An unacknowledged or unrecognized intrusion interrupts the smoothness of life. When we stop and heed room tone, we cede the primacy of our voices to the sound of the space we inhabit. We often need what we don't know we need and silence is no exception. Silence invites the room tone from the background to the foreground. It emerges like the sun from behind a cloud, bringing with it a sense of contiguous reality that smooths over the gaps. This is not always pleasant. When Macbeth's chief servant, Satan, returns from investigating a scream heard off stage, all he says is, Lord, the queen is dead. That's it. After all the talking, scheming, 
and speeches, all the sound and fury, what is left for Macbeth is the silence of that other space. And the simple truth of the words, borne by his faithful lieutenant, who has five lines in the entire play, this one being his last. Baseball's empty stadiums bear a similar heavy truth. By design, the game has always been as much about a spectator's privilege to enjoy a few hours outside watching a ball game played in a garden as about the doings on the field. During the season, many players said something to the effect that once they're between the lines, the game is still the same. But is the game really the same game without onlookers? Soccer and basketball reveal things in that televised silence. How players talk to one another. Baseball players, on the other hand, communicate encoded signals in the seclusion of the dugout, the webbing of a glove covering the mouth, a make-do face mask. How does a sport with so many pauses in it make sense when those pauses reveal a vacuum or worse, artificial noise? After all, an empty seat this year isn't simply the consequence of public health precautions. An empty seat is a consequence of mass death and the threat of mass death. And every single death within that mass death is isolated and horrible. This is what that emptiness means. And this was the room tone of the 2020 Major League Baseball season. A familiar voice from an unfamiliar number left me a message. I understand that you wanted to talk to me about baseball during COVID-19. Give me a call. I gave him a call. You never really get the full impact of what it means to have an empty stadium, except when you're sitting there, Dr. Anthony S. Fauci said. On July 23rd, he threw out the ceremonial first pitch of the first game of the baseball season. The Yankees were in town to play his favorite team, the Washington Nationals, last year's World Series champions. Under normal circumstances, it would have been an affair of pomp and circumstance for the team and the fans, especially super fans like Fauci. But 2020 is playing out in far from normal circumstances. When last seen in action, Nationals Park brimmed with 42,000 noisy fans. Now on a day that threatened rain, there were three, Fauci, his wife, and a friend. We're looking around and we're the only people in the stands, he told me. It was so, so extraordinarily unusual, almost eerie. The game was called after six innings because of rain, with the Nationals losing to the Yankees. Juan Soto, Washington's star, wasn't there. He tested positive for COVID-19. And the rest of the 2020 season wouldn't be any kinder to the Nationals. They finished dead last in their division and didn't play a single game before their fans as the reigning champions. As I write this sentence, enough Americans have died of the novel coronavirus to fill Nationals Park five times over. And certainly that number has increased since I wrote that sentence. Fauci's pitch that day was the most important pitch of the 2020 season. But the less said about that pitch itself, the better. Dr. Anthony Fauci. He reared back to throw the ball toward home and ended up looking instead as if he'd just blown his nose with his right hand and was trying to put the tissue into his left pocket. All the same, Topps made a baseball card commemorating the moment and it set an all time print run record. Over 50,000 people have bought the limited edition card decked out in a white nationals jersey and red world champions mask, a dark glove with snazzy orange highlights on his left hand as the ball floats above his extended right arm. Fauci's eyes following the ball's ill-fated spin. It's actually quite a beautiful shot.
when the Rays finally outlasted the Astros and the Dodgers finally outlasted the Atlanta Braves. The stage was set for a final act of the longest, shortest season ever. An East Coast versus West Coast battle set in Arlington, Texas, in front of a spattering of spectators allowed back into the stands. In the end, I didn't only see them, I could hear them from time to time. As the ball soared up into the air after the thwack of the bat, I'd glimpse them and have to remind myself that they were there. By now, I'd turn the volume back on and sometimes I'd crank it up and listen for the crowd. Those sounds betwixt and between the interspersed vacancies and momentary pauses of the game. Maybe when the camera work allowed, you too saw them on the television and were, as I was, both amazed by and scared for them. Maybe you saw Mookie Betts make it all look so easy from oh so close. doesn't have a lot of stressful innings or long pitch innings. I think the blister, that's what you worry. They're going to make sure. Here's a high fly ball into right back. His bet's on the move on the track. Maybe you saw a Tampa Bay's radiant Cuban rookie, Randy Arozarena, in the flesh and realized you'd get to one day say, I was there when... Good luck boots. Barred them from a teammate, some cowboy boots in Mexico. And here is a shot into right center field. This ball is back at the wall. And he's got another and the all time record for home runs in a single postseason with number nine. More. I don't know if this would make you lucky or unlucky. These are the times we live in. What is lucky and what is unlucky hangs in the air. We either catch it or we don't. Ali Smith begins her novel Autumn like so. It was the worst of times. It was the worst of times. Again. And indeed, it is autumn again. One team won, one team lost. The story of baseball in 2020 has ended in Tampa and Los Angeles, but no baseball has been played in either city for a month. Still, people will wait in lines outside Dodger Stadium and Tropicana Field into November, not for playoff baseball. Baseball, a summer word, won't be what hangs in the air there, then, baseball had come and baseball had gone. The words of the crowds there haven't changed by then to election, justice, vote. The 2020. We were passengers forced to jump into the water when our ship, the 2020, after years of creaking, cracked in half and sank down into the darkness. 
The ship was long thought to be beautiful for it gleamed in the sunlight and it gleamed in the moonlight. It throbbed like a beacon, it could be seen across great distances. And since it was like a beacon, it was taken for a beacon. But the ship was never beautiful. Where there should have been wood, there was gold. And where there could have been gold, there were guns. It was ill-gotten, falsified. And much like it housed every imaginable person, it also housed every imaginable horror. Yes, in a certain light, it could pass for beautiful. But it was the water that was beautiful. It was the water that was part of the natural course of things. Another course of things was the fate of ships that mistook themselves for water, much like our ship had done. It traveled without purpose, aside from the purpose of being itself, which was considered enough of a purpose by those who claimed to own the ship and those who claimed to steer it. And on it went without a sail or engine, simply being suggested forward by what was commonly called the will of God, which was as white as the clouds and as clear as the wind. It has been claimed that this God is endless in his power. Thus he is everywhere. Thus in being unknown, he is known. Thus he guides the ship. Therefore, the wreck under our feet is still guided by him for what he guides never falters and what he touches never breaks. Some of the people in the water are actually saying this. They had been told this, and so they say this. Our ship spins away from us, but our God is here, and our God is our ship, so we are safe here with him. They yell now over the waves as their mouths fill with water. Some thrash, cough, and sink. Some see the others coughing and sinking, and nevertheless start up with the yelling. Again, our ship spins away from us, but our God is here, and our God is our ship, so we are safe here with him. In the distance, the captain clings to a slick chunk of driftwood and can hear them. He doesn't want to hear them and wishes they were dead. He doesn't want to hear anyone and wishes they were all dead. In their death, he reasons he would live. For knowing they had died would surely mean that he had survived. And in surviving, he would be seen as having been right all along, that the ship is the most beautiful ship that there ever was and is perfect as it is. He will find another ship like his father did. He is sure of this. He will find another ship and that ship will pull his ship out of the water and it will be perfect as it is. And he will set off again through the waters with what survivors are left. And why can't everyone see that and know that that's fine? The ship, after all, had been broken before. It never quite sank, but it had been broken. That was many captains ago, and not this captain's fault at all, this captain thought. Amid the chaos, the most chaos is where the captain is. He thrashes like he's never seen water before. He is at the center of a circle of trusted people who also embraced whatever floats and therefore keeps them afloat. They yell across the water to each other, to the captain, to the sky. Those who yelled our ship spins away from us, but our God is here and our God is our ship, so we are safe here with him, took the yelling they heard coming back from that direction to be the same as what they were yelling. And so they yelled back to it, but louder. Their covered feet keep paddling to keep their heads above the water. Their arms keep parting the water. They are tired, but believe in their salvation and in the purity of it 
and of the water. That purity came in the form of the freedom of their movement, how they kick and wade, how they hold their children above their heads and above the water, keeping their wary eyes open for a sign from God or anyone of vague to opaque pigmentation. They refuse the stray life jackets that bob toward them. Freedom is in being able to say, is in being able to say no to these things. And they like saying no so much, they say it again and again, as they had seen done on the television or heard done on the radio. Whatever floats by them is greeted by a chorus of no's. So that what's heard in the water, above all else, is no, shipsmen's away from us. No, God is here and our God is our no. So we are here safe with no. And when no God comes, they call this God's prophecy fulfilled. Tell me a story, you said. And I am here to tell you a story. Remember that you all were on a ship and that the ship snapped in half. I could tell you what to believe and not to believe about how that happened. Or I could teach you how to tread water for days, how to let the salt water enter and swill around on your tongue until the salt is gone and you can swallow it. How to dive under the surface with your eyes open to catch a glimpse of the ship, if only to remind yourself that there really was once a ship under your feet. And because there was once a ship under your feet, you could argue that you used to walk on water. The ship did not snap in half because you had walked on water. The ship snapped in half because it thought that it walked on water, which was God's plan as the ship was in the image of his son. And as God sacrificed his only son, he would also sacrifice his only ship. That there were many other ships seen in the water and that the ship balance on the surface of the water due to basic science and craft work was a dissenting opinion reserved for specific sections of the ship. But let's not about that. Tell me a story, you said. Tell me about the current state of things, you said. And so here I am telling you a story about the current state of things. Forget that there's no land in sight. Forget the harbor lights you think you see far off in the horizon's fiery zone, and yes, I see them too. Those are other ships, and they have heard of us, and they will have nothing to do with us. And after so many months now like this, making broken figure eights in the water, watching, listening, waiting, I am limited in my imagination. I can only tell you what I see and what I hear. Nonsense, protests, contemplations, and drowning, drowning, drowning. I have swum as far from here as I can go and seen other ships and they have not sunk. I saw a ship cracked open like an egg, but then pulled back together and fused by a chain of people stretched from one side of the ship to the other and simply refusing to let go. Perhaps we could have done that. It is summer and the water is warm and we have killed most of the predators for food or distraction. So we should be able to survive like this for a while. We are strong, dumb, and resilient. Someone will do a head count so we know what we number. And someone will ask the captain what we do next and come back with his answer. 
Better to send an interpreter, since the captain speaks in what can only be called riddles, if we assume that the captain is sane and capable and cares. But you would be right to ask whether we need to listen to the captain, as there's no longer a ship, though the captain says there is indeed still a ship, and that it will be hoisted up from the deep and ready to go again by fall. <sighs> yes, he said that. You asked me to tell you a story. And I assume you want facts in it. The sun is God. And the ship on the ocean floor is God. Therefore, the attraction of the sun and the ship will lift the ship back up to the surface of the water. This is his fact. His circle, no matter how well or poorly one of them swims, spins around him like a wheel, circling its focus, yelling his fact, so that all of us stranded here at sea can hear it. The yell being how they think to subdue nature. For as you yell, you are heard. And if you are heard, you are alive. It's that simple. The natural thing now would be to be dead, would it not? But yelling, after all that has happened, is proof that we are here, is it not? Yelling turns fact into feeling. The people who yelled about God and the ship feel this way now. And as they heard it being yelled from the captain, spinning circle. It must be so. And so now they yell, the sun is God and the ship is God and we shall meet both in the middle. I'm tired of being told to pity them. No ship is unstored and our ship is not without its fill of them. Yet I have felt compelled to tell you about the water, the black jade of it, that it undulated just above and just below the eyes like when you stand a sheet's length away from your mother and shake the sheet before walking toward her so she can fold it. That it blackens like dark matter in the night when the mist rises and clouds the eyes and you can hear chants from the other sides of the ship that it shimmers like the feathers on a peacock's neck. The water. The acute changes that over the span of a day don't seem like changes at all, but rather just itself. I worry about all of us becoming just like that. Change confused for simply itself change unrecognized in a tightening gyre of sound and sound alone. But what about the ship, you ask? What happened to the ship? It's always had its problems, but why did it finally come apart? Did it hit something? The answer natural history. Look up. See that bird circling overhead? All red on one half of their body and all white on the other? That's called a hermaphrodite cardinal. There is no reason they should be here. And yet they are. Do what you can to drown out all the other noise. Listen to them sing. Go 
I have been listening to them and little else for months now. I have followed them miles from the shipwreck and have returned when they have returned. They refuse to leave and refuse to land. I never saw them before the ship went down, but I had heard something in the air that I now know was them. A man I didn't know and yet knew had told me what I heard. He was obsessed with birds and could name them by what song they sang. Some storytellers raise, rise light late in the day and tell stories until late in the night. I am a storyteller who rises early in the morning when the sky is that rare lilac beige. That would be when I would see him on the deck, binoculars around his neck, thick glasses on his face, a Star Trek t-shirt and a look on his face that would say, I am listening. And not wanting to bother him, I would stay and listen too for the Oriole and the woodpecker, the red-winged blackbird, and the black-capped chickadee. I would follow him, saying little to him so as neither to disturb him nor scare away the birds. He would say nothing to me, but he would sing to the birds. They would arrive, sing, and leave, seemingly pleased to have left me rooted there, both the bird and the man I knew. The ship, as always, was going nowhere, but this man had somewhere to be. He would be in those moments, not on that stagnant ship, but where the birds had been. Seeing this man was like looking into a mirror. His blackness, his height, his sense of aloofness, his stolid reality in an abstract world. One day, a few months ago, he simply said one word, and with that one word, the ship jumped. The water was smooth, and the sky was clear. But when the ship caught air and then landed again, it had changed. It was as though it had leaped through time. The gold on the ship had turned to verdigris, and the guns were now pointed back at the ship itself. Have you ever heard the great catbird? Related to the mockingbirds and thrashers, it is about the size of two small fists. I had learned from the man by watching him. All of the successes and frustrations in the world can be reduced to a moment of silent listening. I would watch him and watch him being watched and watch him watch himself being watched all while he listened. And I too tried to listen as he listened. The gray cat bird. I had never seen one until that morning. They tend to chill in the bush and sing from there. I remember my mother's reprimand when I tried to step onto the deck, my hair and clothes, that people would think I was from the bush, though there were no bushes on the ship. The ship that morning had been coursing in the sun, bending light around it like a halo, but a hazy gray set in for the day. He told me to be quiet. 
This was the first time he'd ever said anything to me, though I hadn't said a word. Shh. He said to me again, as though my presence itself was too lush. Hey, Eric! Hey, Eric! The great catbird started to sing. Hey, Eric! Hey, Eric! Is that your niche? Shh. Hey, Eric! 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 Is that your n Shh. Hey, Eric! Hey, Eric! And then he simply said, no. This is when the ship caught the air, launching itself like a cat from certainty to uncertainty. And as it touched down again, first the bow, then the stern, which lifted the bow before it crashed down again. And the sound of the sea surge against the other side of the ship swelled in all of our ears. I swear to you that the water sounded like it was saying, George. 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 And now I'll just, um, I'll read a couple of poems. We always say a couple when we don't mean to. I'm gonna read four poems. Uh, this first one's called Prelude uh, and it's an elegy. One. My grandmother saw it coming and left. I'd already left. It came late and swift, like a tidal wave mistaken for a wave. Came not as a note, but as an octave. Black keyed and mangled, searching the hospice only to find she'd left without notice. The soul clapped from her body, masked by death. Death hiding death from death and finding no sign of her in the high cheekbones or skin, strode out on a cough into the evening. Two, in the weeks between her death and being laid to rest, life became COVID-19. Both the living and the dead shared one air. Then the service came and I was not there. I watched from the safe distance of an app as my mother and uncle, massed among the massed few in a pewless space, made peace with the orphans who'd come to take their place. Looking at them on screen was like looking out at the world through the bars of a cage. Three. And now, high on a slope near Van Cortland, the immortelles of perfect pitch sing Ina Harris to sleep. Her shade goes there to listen, bathed in the scent of ilex, palm, linden, kapok. It is Easter and she is dressed in her lilac best and hat her daughter crossed bridge and Bronx and plague to bring to her. 
She is two steps ahead of this pentameter as it follows her through the flexed valley of the shadow of death. This elegy which, like all of them, is so useless and late. My grandmother saw it coming and she left. Um, and now this isn't um, out yet, but the, this will be in Plowshares, which is coming out any day now. Um, and this is called uh, Lost. I'm gonna to read to you a fragment of book one. Um, I don't wanna say that I'm rewriting Paradise Lost, um, but I'm rewriting Paradise Lost. Um, picture, picture taking the poem and um, just the things that I wouldn't have written, I take out. But the poem that I'm working on is only based on uh, Milton's words and morphemes in order. So you could consider it a type of erasure without the look of scratching things out. Um, you know, I find it akin to, if you know Max Richter's um, reconsideration of um, Vivaldi's Four Seasons, which is such a beautiful work. And, uh, you know, Max said that he, he looked over the, the sheet music and when he would look at, um, you know, Vivaldi's sheet music, basically you get lost in the music and start to think about, okay, where in this does it end and I begin? Though I think you could also look at it and say, okay, well, where does this begin and I end? It's kind of the same process. Um, and that's um, largely the process that I'm undertaking here. So why don't, we, uh, why don't we take a look at this? Lost, book one. Of a first disobedience and the fruit of that tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, sing muse of heaven and earth rose out of chaos. Aid my adventurous song that attends to soar while it pursues things attempted in prose and rhyme. Instruct me from the first present with wings outspread, dove-like, vast, what in me is mine, raise and support that. What in me is dark, raise and support that. What in me is dark, illumine. Raise and raise and raise the height of this great argument and justify the ways of God to me. Say heaven hides nothing from view. The deep tract of hell, our grandparents' happy state, Lords of the world who seduced them revolt, guile, envy, revenge, deceived mankind, pride cast out with rebel angels by whose aid he trusted to have equaled the most high and ambitious aim against the God, raised war in heaven and hurled headlong flaming from the ethereal sky, hideous down to bottomless perdition to dwell in chain fire, the omnipotent arms nine times the space that measures day and night he lay vanquished in the fiery gulf confounded though immortal but his doom the thought of lost happiness and lasting pain torments him his eyes witness affliction and dismay mixed with pride and steadfast hate at once, as far as angels can, he views the dismal situation, waste and wild, a dungeon, all but all one great flame, yet from those flames no light, but rather darkness visible, regions of sorrow, shades where peace and rest never come, hope never comes, all torture without end still urges. Sulfur consumed, such eternal justice prepared for those rebellions, their prison. Utter darkness set far removed from the center, overwhelmed with flood and whirlwinds of fire. He soon discerns, weltering by his side, one long known in Palestine, and to whom with bold words, breaking silence, thus began.
oh, this is the penultimate poem I'll read to you. It's called Romanticism. It's going to appear in the same um, issue of Plowshares. And part of the reason I've been thinking about romanticism so much is um, um, because of the environment here. It, I, I find it hard to um, not be thinking about romanticism. Larry and, and Jess may, may argue with me on that, but I've just found myself really thinking about large, large case R romanticism quite a bit. Late autumn in the orange bronze ranges and the sky still wet with slaughter. The vote done, dying goldenrod tuning the meadows beige under flocks of birds that flex the air into one black V after another, carrying with them the occasional silence that flight coaxes from the chest, throat, and mind, coaxes from altitude's blue view to me. Though the bright air, no matter how clear, is viscous with the virus, not dew. It comes and goes like the heat of the sun, a heavy haze of grand scale indifference to the mazy motion of the river that bends away from the small town nearby. As I raise my window for one final song of summer to leap into my room and chant to my well-funded memory, when the window is shut tight and the cold burns as I press my nose against the glass for one brief glimpse of God in this world. What moves in the far off fade spectrum of the wattage as daylight grows dimmer and that feeling comes and goes, what is it? I have asked myself again and again and I want to tell you that it's something else, something new, a cure for this world. So I do, and then I don't, and then I do. Vespers. Um, uh, Natalie Anderson is a, um, poet who was um, long taught at Swarthmore College. Um, she taught me. Um, and I wrote this poem for her. Vespers. In the end, there was no summer with her. No bare feet on the dashboard as the road behind us fades into summer weather. No poem of summer. No pics to download. She is the poet. I am the ringer in a robin spring. Oh, what I'd lost sight of. As when you see the sun and linger on it. Retine daring the sun to glare it all gone. Would she settle for that song? The music in the darkness, the rings made in a darkness made by closed eyes, the wrong power for the right fool. I would have said, what would I have said? What is there to say? The sun sets like a line of poetry. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias.